Hi guys. Hi Instagram. If you feel I feel like doing this. <laughs> Come along if you feel. Hi Facebook. All right, guys, if you're just coming on now and you know someone who needs to learn about how to use their cycle as their superpower or something to do with wrapping up endometriosis awareness, like Shelly, hi, <laughs> then please share that we are here live for the next 20 minutes and no longer because I have book club, guys. And if you didn't join, well, too bad, so sad, because we're going to rock that out tonight. I'm very excited about book club tonight. We're just going to fade the music out because well we're like I said we're here for a uh, a good time not a long time but really keen to talk and answer your questions tonight as we wrap up endometriosis awareness month but also I've got as always a really good treat for you guys at the end of this where I want to give you some key takeaways to save and share via Facebook and Instagram about oh hello from Dubai I've got all the love tonight about what you can do to use your cycle as your superpower and if you're not feeling it and it's not bringing it for you then we need to make some pretty hefty changes because it's really not that hard but I am early tonight you normally we're on here a little bit later but like I said book club is starting tonight so we're pushing out ask Nat I'm oh, not pushing it out we're making it earlier for the next four weeks but if you've got questions about your cycle then I definitely want to know what they might be here's what I want to tell you about your menstrual cycle we see it as a drag we see our period as a drag we hate on it but if we were smart enough to know a when it's coming and b what we need to do if we have to deliver at that stage of our cycle it's a total game changer and if you're having horrible symptoms at certain times of your cycle, how that is such a window into what your hormones are telling you each and every month. And so, hello. <laughs> and so I want to invite you to start asking some questions around that and how you might see your cycle, what you might um, find frustrating about your cycle, but also what we can do to start to create change so that you can start to use it, like I said, as your Superpower. Um, I think the biggest mistake that we make as women is we try and do all the things all the time. And granted, we're amazing multitaskers. We're very good at doing many things, but something has to give. We're not, our bodies aren't designed to give 160% all of the time, but we think it is. And so I know we're all guilty and I really am too, that we get to our period and we push on through as if it's the same as when we're maybe in our ovulation phase, which is our ovulation phase is a time that we should be able to go and do all the things and have all the superpowers. But at menstruation, it's okay to sit on the couch. It's okay not to want to train. It's okay to not bring it. But if you know this about yourself and say you have an important presentation or a project then how do you actually bring it on those days and there's some key things that you can do to support yourself at each phase of the cycle now I do want to make sure that we're recognizing the end of endo awareness month but if you're watching this as a replay March is endo awareness month and we do everything that we can to create awareness and draw awareness to a very debilita debilitating condition that somewhere between 10 to 20% of women experience. And um, whilst I wasn't diagnosed with endometriosis, I certainly was the girl on the floor, in the bathroom, when my period would come and I would either be vomiting or passed out from the pain and waking up in hot sweats and it was awful. And so it wasn't so much that I had an epiphany that I wanted to feel better. It was I didn't like the way I felt in my body in terms of inflammation and weight gain and just feeling downright gross, acne, all the things. So that was my motivation as a young 19-year-old to do something different and well, when your clothes start to fit better and you start to feel better, your bowels are better, your acne's diminishing, your bloating goes away, like all of these things get better. It's enough of a motivation to definitely keep on going. And so 
that was my experience when that was happening. Now, my, my inflammation pain and whether it was endo or not, I never had a laparoscopy to confirm that. I do want to make sure that everybody does realize that to confirm endometriosis, you really do need a laparoscopy. And I have patients all the time that tell me they've been diagnosed via a blood test. That's not actually possible to diagnose endometriosis via a blood test. And sometimes it's expected or suspected on a ultrasound, but you really need a laparoscopy to be able to diagnose that. The reason that you would have that is because you have a lot of pain and often debilitating pain at the period time. But there are women who experience very light periods, not heavy bleeding and not much pain that also present with endometriosis. And I like to look at it in two different camps. You either have this excess condition where there's just so much bleeding so much pain and it finds it the the body finds it hard to move that that blood out which can cause a lot of pain but then for the people that have really scanty bleeding that doesn't mean that you don't have endometriosis that can actually be more painful than those that bleed heavily because there's there's a flow to those that bleed heavily whereas those that bleed quite lightly and don't have much of a flow if it's not moving that can be really painful as well so it is important to be able to decipher and look and profile your symptoms to be able to provide yourself as clues as to how you would address that i would address heavy bleeding and pain but light bleeding and extreme pain because often it's actually worse when it's light because of that lack of flow very differently one needs to move the other needs to be um the inflammation needs to be uh, diminished, but also that that stagnation, that congestion, that's the other thing that we would work on through the pelvis. So pelvic cavity, sorry. So there's, there's, it, there's not one way to do something, but there's definitely a way that we can profile and look at your symptoms to allow you to administer the best treatments or lifestyle changes or dietary changes or whatever that might look like to create a better outcome and that's what I'm here to help you with so if you do have questions there's a lot of people joining but no one really asking very much which is very rare um but if you do have questions then well don't be shy um step right up to the plate because I'm only here for another 10 minutes or so and I really want to help you and then at the very end like I said I'm going to share with you that really useful um PDF that we've created for you to do things at the phases of your cycle to help you get the best out of your cycle. And what I want you to do with that is once I load it up, I want you to find it and then I want you to share it with people that you know or just on your page or wherever if you're in the health and wellness um, arena, but maybe you're not, maybe you know somebody that has a lot of issues with their cycle, then they can start to do these little tips and tricks that you can start to do in the home, which I absolutely love because... Well, it's not what you necessarily always do in your appointment with your healthcare provider. It's actually what you do when you leave that really counts. So I want to show you what to do when you leave. And I'm always going to make that very, very safe and general when we're on a platform such as Instagram or Facebook or YouTube or wherever you're watching this. Um, I don't want it ever to be something that you are worried about, but you should always seek the advice of your healthcare provider if you have questions. So I'm going to try and make it as general and as safe as possible. Um, but if you have a known condition, it's always important that you go and ask the right questions. And that can be hard too. Having the right questions, questions can be really difficult. So this is um, so Bianca's asking best foods to eat first day of the cycle or any supplements to take. Bianca, you're going to need to hang around and watch what I share when we hang up because that is what's going to give you some foods and some supplements that you can start to take. But if you want to think about the menstrual cycle as a cycle and you go through a bleeding phase, which is the phase where we really need to go inward, really need to be kind to ourselves, rest, sleep more, maybe move less, eat a little bit more for nourishment. We then move into the follicular phase, which is the phase where we're building our lining, we're maturing our follicle or follicles um, for uh, to allow with... Um, to allow for ovulation to eventually occur um, and our home our estrogen especially is building at this time and we start to feel really good we should really start to as we move through the follicular phase into ovulation we should feel really good this is the time when we want to start projects where we want to start new things be creative um, execute goals and start to or start to exit put the scaffolding or the network in place to, to get your projects and goals achieved we then move into ovulation which is the <laughs> i say this all the time but your body she's a mean machine she's always working to try and have you fall pregnant 
Um, and so if at this time, if you don't feel great, then that's definitely a clue, but you should feel excellent. You should feel like you want to be social, that you look healthy, that you feel healthy, um, and that you are ready to be social and meeting people. Um, and then you move into your luteal phase, which is if there's conception doesn't occur and the implantation doesn't occur, then your body gets ready to basically rinse and repeat. Um, and so as we move through the luteal phase, there's different things that we can do. Um, definitely moving into that premenstrual phase and then we repeat the process. So definitely understanding that can be really useful to get the best out of your work week, to get the best out of your training. Um, there's so many facets to that that you can use as your superpower, like I said. Um, I had an ectopic last year and removed the right tube. Left tube is stuck to the left ovary. I have stage four endo. Do you have knowledge of anyone be able to detach the tube without surgery? Um, Jen, if you're wanting to fall pregnant, I would always recommend that you would seek the help of your specialist um, in terms of what you can do for that. There are ways to treat this naturally, but they take a long time. And well, they don't always take a long time, but I always say to my fertility patients, let's just get to it. Like, what do we need to do to get there? Um, perhaps you might give yourself some breathing room in between babies and you might fix it then. But the hard part is when it comes to fertility and conception and pregnancy is the stress that that causes far outweighs what you might be able to come and do using assisted methods. So never rule that out. I, in a perfect world, I'd love to be able to say, sure, this is what we do. And without seeing you in the, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, that's really tricky too. But I really want to say there's no shame in whatever you need to do to get your precious pregnancy and baby there's no shame in that so we love the natural way and I'm all for the natural way but sometimes we need to go to the safest and quickest way um, to do that where it doesn't become all overwhelming and consuming and especially when we've got um, issues and complications where we've got um, scarring or we've got adhesions or we've got other tissue that is um, that is is compromising the state of your pelvic cavity then that might be something to consider but we're here to support you um and there's lots of ways to do that so perhaps it's something that i would be able to reducing scar tissue is the thing you're specifically talking and asking if you head over to my website one of the best ways besides using um, various herbal um, formulas is castor oil packs um, so you might want to go and check that out I can provide some links with that as well when we hang up that I have um, for some great resources for castor oil packs. But also if you go to my website and search castor oil packs, that's a great place to also look. Um, Jodie's asking, what is a healthy flow and how do you measure that? So <laughs> I always learn in terms of tampons and pads. Um, I'm not great with metrics of cups, but uh, really somewhere under 60 to 80 mils is considered normal flow if you are using a cup for the duration of your period, I believe. When it comes to a pad or a tampon, what does that look like? Um, a flow is something that starts strong and tapers off over time. And I would say, Jodie's saying she loves castor oil packs, I love that. I would say um, changing a pad or tampon no more than four hourly really is a good indication of a healthy flow. So if you're changing your paddle tampon on those heavier days more than that, then that is a heavy bleed and you definitely want to look into why that's happening. Have you seen anyone with endo that also experiences hypoglycemia? Seems to experience this. So insulin resistance is so commonly at the center of many hormone imbalances um, and something that I would definitely encourage you to look into. Um, my best hack for that, and I've written about it on my website as well, which you can go and check out at natcringudis.com, is looking at fasting and intermittent fasting and how after times of fasting, it makes ourselves more sensitive to insulin. And that can be a game changer. So it's not the, the hypoglycemia as such or the, the insulin resistance that um, is, what it's doing is it is, it's messing around with your hormones, which is then feeding the issue of the hormone, uh, sorry, the issue of the endo. So it doesn't cause it, but it feeds it, if that makes sense. Uh, what else we got here? I've been offered surgery next month to try and detach the tube. I'm worried it'll affect my fertility even more. I know endo is really tricky. It is really hard to know, and they're not going to know until they go and have a look, but I really feel like that's probably, if that's what your doctors are talking about, it's a really um, important option to consider moving into fertility. So um, I think that that would be uh, definitely a, a, a good step 
given the history and also that you, you know, you're at a point where you definitely want to make that happen. Um, diagnosed with endo, my periods are really bad. I get worse anxiety leading up to bleeding. Mouth literally goes dry and have panic attacks. What can I do? Magnesium, 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 magnesium as a starting point, 100%. Um, morning and night start off with that and it, it's not going to it's not going to be the one thing to fix everything but it's going to help with this a lot so and it's very safe for you to have so i would say to start with that i would say to start to look at how you can help your liver detoxify a little bit better bit of greens dandelion um, more leafy greens cooked cruciferous veggies broccoli um, those things that really help with liver detoxification um, anything we can do to help to clear out that excess estrogen that's problematic to feed the endo is going to be really important. So making sure your bowels are moving every day, um, like I said, making sure your liver is happy and making sure the gut is also um, as cared for as possible are things that you can definitely safely try without having to um, worry too much. Uh, chase tree berry for estrogen dominance. That's great. Should I take this for life? No. Okay. So the thing is that we need to work out why is your estrogen doing that? And I've spoken about this a lot of times. It's not that you have estrogen dominance because no one's arguing with you. If you have excess estrogen and you have all those symptoms, you have it. But it is the fact that why you have it. And until you work out why, you can't actually fix it. So Yes, okay, if you don't work out why, you will need to do something like take Chase Tree forever. But if we can work out what's actually going on and what's feeding the excess estrogen, then we can actually make changes. So we've spoken about this many times before, but we need to look at external factors. They're environmental, chemicals in our body products, in our water, in our cleaning products, just in our general environment, high stress. Um, absolutely drives estrogen crazy. Certain um, foods, excess consumption of alcohol and soy can be problematic. Um, so looking at those external factors and then looking at internally, how is my body working to regulate my estrogen? Is that actually happening for me once I've ticked off those external factors? And stress is a hard one, um, but it's so important because otherwise, I mean, it's, I say to patients all the time, we need to manage your stress better. Otherwise, we're just going to have to use supplements forever. It's not really sustainable and it's, it's expensive and it's unnecessary. But also, stress is going to continue to show up in various ways. So um, we then look at our gut, we look at our liver, we look at our bowels, we look at our thighs. 